Fair Review, Print Speaking to the Blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Kuhn Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at cunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141 772 3976. That's 0141 772 3976. This is from the Herald Scotland of Wednesday the 10th of July 2024 from the Voices section. Duncan MacLennan. Privatising Glasgow housing stock was a wise choice. This article is by Martin Williams. And the introduction is Duncan MacLennan, who was the long-standing director of Glasgow University's Centre for Housing and Urban Research in the 80s and 90s, and has wide experience of UK policy, says the transfer of housing to the Glasgow Housing Association was a wise choice. The Emeritus Professor in Urban Studies at the University of Glasgow says it is not only one of the largest, but one of the most enduring successful projects of the Scottish Executive. Here, Mr MacLennan, who was a right-hand man to the late Donald Dewar, the father of Scottish devolution, explains why. And the article continues. There is a wicked crisis in rental housing in most British cities that involves not just growing shortages and rising rent burdens, but also deteriorating quality and diminished investment in council housing. Although affected by wider rental investment shortages, Glasgow has been fortunate, as expressed in the views of tenants and the reviews of independent experts, in having avoided many of the difficulties within social housing. Figures reported by the Scottish Housing Regulator show that other Scottish cities have lower tenant satisfaction scores than Wheatley achieves in Glasgow, and this can be attributed in part to the legacy of investment from the transfer. That reflects the wisdom of Glasgow's council tenants in voting to transfer their homes to the Glasgow Housing Association, the GHA, in 2003. The transfer has subsequently allowed their association to radically improve stock, remove thousands of decaying homes that would have cost more to refurbish than rebuild, and create new homes and better neighbourhoods, such as the remade Gorbals, Tory Glen and Site Hill. Nothing in Scotland, and little in the rest of the UK, equals that progress. By the middle of the 1990s, reflecting inadequate strategic management by both local and national governments, Glasgow's council housing was on a vicious downward spiral. Stock quality was falling. Only emergency maintenance was undertaken. Tenants were leaving. And whilst the rents of tenants were rising, burgeoning vacancies meant that total rent revenues were falling and reducing the capacity to repay the city's £1 billion housing debt. The system, by 1999 had transformed billions of pounds of post-war investment in Glasgow's council housing to a stock with a negative value. Restoring these homes would have required half of the Scottish public housing's budget for at least a decade. Sir Monty Finiston's commission on on Glasgow's housing in the late 1980s suggested that the council were not equipped to cope with the crisis emerging in their own housing and should transfer a significant share of homes to non-profits. Subsequent council leaders bought into that notion for change. By 1999, 
some 16,000 homes had already been sold to community-based associations and co-ops and tenants in council neighbourhoods could see the transformative effects of these transfers for themselves. Donald Dewar, then MP and then MSP for Drum Chapel, also saw these changes and devoted a significant share of the time he had as First Minister to ensuring that all of Glasgow's tenants got the chance for change. Arguably, creating the GHA was not only one of the largest, but one of the most enduring, successful projects of the Scottish Executive. Only the most ideologically focused of critics, with scant interest in tenant well-being and with no interest in evidence, can deny that GHA has made Glasgow a much better place. We now need urgent action to develop similarly, hold new policies to boost rental and social rental housing investment in the city. The Wheatley Group, building on the transfer, are now well placed to give momentum to these changes. Doing housing business as usual does not help now, nor does an unrealistic recall of how problematic Glasgow's council housing was in 1999. That article was by Martin Williams. This is from the Herald Scotland of Wednesday the 10th of July 2024 from the Voices section. Relax. The grown-ups are back in charge, aren't they? This article is by Alison Rowett. Respect to Tony Blair for waiting so long before he jumped in the back seat and started giving directions to the new Prime Minister. It must have been, what, all of two minutes? They don't move that fast in the pits at Silverstone. First, the former Premier used a newspaper article to punt his idea for ID cards. Next came a speech at the humbly titled Tony Blair Institute for Global Change on how artificial intelligence could save the public sector billions. So far, Sir Tony, as we must now rather annoyingly call him for reasons of consistency, is being treated with the politeness due to a neighbour who peers over the fence and tells you how to cut the grass. Team Starmer does not need Sir Tony giving them advice in person. With so many old faces from the Blair years popping up in government, It looks like the infiltration work is already done. Still, given the feelings Sir Tony arouses in some quarters, it would be wise to keep the man himself a suitable distance away. Perhaps Elon Musk can find him something to do in space. There is another reason to let voicemail do the honours next time Sir Tony calls. Should the new Prime Minister need an ideas guru, a suitable candidate is ready and waiting, one who is wise, inspiring and possessed of an unparalleled notions of top ten hits from the 1970s. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Ken Bruce. The greatest hits radio DJ earned the thanks of a nation this week when he told his former employers at Radio 2 to grow up and stop trying to be cool. Radio 2 is a state of mind, he told the Beyond the Title podcast. It is for people over 35, with jobs, families and other responsibilities, folk who don't care about looking uncool. Well said, Sir Ken, he is not, but he should be, in siding with the Dobby's club card set against the clubbers, our Ken has hit the cultural nail on the head. He also happens to be perfectly in tune with the political mood of the times. Not that he would have intended such a thing, 
Ken is far too smart to get involved in politics, but here we are anyway. As we have all heard by now, Britain under Sir Keir Starmer is a serious, grown-up place once more. Gone are those rowdy hooligans with their parties and their proroguing of Parliament. In their place are fine, upstanding people, devoted to public service. Elected on a promise to end the chaos of the Tories, Sir Keir's first speech as Prime Minister in Downing Street spoke of respect, public service, duty, stability and moderation, and sailing away to calmer waters. It could have been an advert for a lovely five-stop European cruise. Pure Radio 2. Sir Keir is rather more Radios 3 and 4 than Radio 2, but he wouldn't say no to some orange juice and the Smiths if they were on the Radio 2 menu. Overall, he comes across as serious and hard-working, someone who sticks to the letter of the law. He is the opposite of one of his predecessors, Boris Johnston, whose misplaced frivolity he despised. The new Prime Minister is a grown-up, and proud of it, and he wants his ministers to be the same. Any transgressions and their feet won't touch the floor, as he was fond of saying on the campaign trail when another Tory scandal erupted. A fitting soundtrack to these sterner, starmer times is not Things Can Only Get Better. It is Hip to be Square by Huey Lewis and the News. That absolute banger, as the young people say, captures the change of mood as accurately as any opinion poll. The SNP was way ahead of the trend when it opted for John Swinney as party leader and first minister, with Kate Forbes as his deputy. It is hard to imagine a more hip-to-be-square duo. Now that they have parked independence and promised to get on with the day job, the pair will make Stakhanov look a lightweight. As for Nicola Sturgeon, she was square, then hip, and that's when the trouble arguably started. Scottish Labour leader Anna Sawa will no doubt get with the serious programme if he can ever stop smiling for long enough, while his deputy, Jackie Bailey, is already adept at switching from twinkly-eyed amusement to full-on T-Rex, if the occasion requires. The politicians are doing their bit to be serious, as is the media. I'm not sure how long the latter's reverence will last. Some commentators lost no time in going full Trump about the result, arguing that being elected with a record low share of the vote was no victory at all. Funny that. They were never bothered when first past the post returned Conservative governments and left the majority of Scots unrepresented. Hats off, however, to the restraint being shown towards the Prime Minister's wife, Victoria, and the Starmer children. It has been a whole week, and the only coverage has been about the fashion label Vic Favours. In a week stuffed with remarkable images, the sight of hundreds of new Labour MPs in Westminster Hall fair took the breath away. Some called it a family picture, but it was more like a school photo. All those smiles and new suits. All that future ahead of them. Serious as he is, even Sir Keir has found it hard not to look chuffed this past week. He knows the upbeat mood of the country, such as it is, will not last. So far, the initial speeches aside the new government is still focusing on the mistakes of the old one. Next comes the hard part, 
taking its own decisions and being held accountable for them. Mistakes will be made. Expectations were managed during the campaign and are still being managed in government. As Sir Keir said, changing a country is not like flicking a switch. It is the grown-up thing to say, but it may surprise ministers how quickly it gets old. But for now, as they would have said on the old uncool Radio 2, here's Bill Withers telling everyone to have a lovely day. That article was by Alison Rowett. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 11th of July from the Voices section. Breathing new life into Glasgow's architectural heritage. This article is written by M.J. O'Shaughnessy. With our city landscapes continually evolving, the eye is naturally drawn to the plethora of exciting new developments appearing, as if by magic. What can be overlooked, or indeed missed completely, is the work taking place to breathe new life into our historic buildings, many of which have lain derelict or in a state of neglect for decades. Glasgow City Centre boasts a rich tapestry of historical architecture, with many of these buildings constructed during the 19th century for commercial and manufacturing use. Sadly, some have fallen into such a state of disrepair that the only option is demolition, and once they're gone, they're gone. At Will Rudd, the D word, demolition, is only used as a last resort. We are skilled in assessing all forms of historic construction and materials to thoroughly interrogate an old building, to analyse its inherent robustness and whether it can be saved. Essentially, we don't just judge a book by its cover. A recent example is the work we've been doing to preserve and restore all the listed buildings as part of the exciting Love Loan development. This intricate and complex project included carving a new basement out of the rock, as well as the restoration of the Grade A listed former parish halls. Sadly, I believe there is a stigma within the construction and engineering sector that rehabilitating empty historic buildings is simply too much work. I want to dispel this myth through the work of what we're doing across the UK and Ireland to bring historic buildings back from the brink. Just because the external facade or roof may appear visually compromised by natural weathering, for example, doesn't mean all is lost. Indeed, restoring and preserving existing buildings rather than demolishing them not only conserves our history but also reduces carbon footprints. We're committed to sustainable retrofitting of these buildings ensuring they are just as relevant in the 21st century. We don't take this responsibility lightly. We are able to successfully blend our passion for conservation of the built environment with additional expertise in sustainability to help our clients unlock commercial viability. With Glasgow aiming to increase its city centre population to 40,000 by 2035, as well as unveiling ambitious plans for a huge overhaul of its Golden Z, attention must be directed to where these people are going to live and work. For us, a key solution lies in the existing buildings, which are so often overlooked but have stood the test of time. They should be part of this great renaissance of Glasgow's built environment. Preserving our historic buildings while adapting them for the demands of modern life is a delicate balancing act and one which requires the utmost skill. Only by understanding the construction techniques, significance and assessment of materials used, as well as their aesthetic value, can we best preserve, restore and conserve our historic buildings. As time moves on, we should be focusing more on how we can effectively marry old and new, and how our historic buildings can be lovingly brought back to life in a sustainable way. 
We see this as an opportunity to fuse the past and the future, creating sustainable and functional spaces that honour the city's heritage. Our dedication to preservation aligns with Glasgow's ambition to be a city that respects its roots while embracing innovation. That article was written by M.J. O'Shaughnessy. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 11th of July. From the news section. Man arrested over attempted murder of police officer in Edinburgh. This article is written by Jodie Harrison. A man has been arrested following the attempted murder of a police officer in Edinburgh. The 32-year-old officer was on foot when he was injured in an incident involving a stolen Mercedes GLE, police said. The officer was conveyed to the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh with serious but not life-threatening injuries and has since been discharged. The vehicle had been reported stolen from the Gorgie Road area around 7.05pm that evening. A 16-year-old boy was a passenger within the vehicle at the time of the theft and managed to exit the vehicle a short time later. He was not injured in the incident. A 27-year-old man has been arrested in connection with numerous charges, including attempted murder, theft of a motor vehicle, abduction, dangerous driving and other road traffic offences. He is expected to appear at Edinburgh Sheriff Court. Detective Inspector David McAlinden said, This was a very serious incident and we are continuing to provide support to the officer and his family. I would like to thank members of the public for quickly coming to our colleagues' aid and for their assistance with our inquiries at the scene. We are aware that damage was done to several vehicles in the area during the incident and we would encourage any further witnesses or anyone with information who have yet to speak with police to please come forward. That article was written by Jodie Harrison. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 11th of July from the Voices section. Scottish economy slows but beats many other parts of the UK. This article is written by Ian McConnell. Scottish private sector economic growth slowed sharply in June as services sector expansion cooled, a key survey shows, and the expansion rate north of the border slipped below that of the UK as a whole last month, according to the latest growth tracker published today by Royal Bank of Scotland. Nevertheless, Scotland was in the top half of the Growth League table with the 12 nations and regions of the UK in sixth spot. Scotland outperformed Yorkshire and Humber, South East England and Wales, which all saw declines in combined services and manufacturing output in June, and the East of England, East Midlands and West Midlands, which all recorded weaker growth than north of the border last month. The declines in activity in South East England and Wales in June were marginal. Meanwhile, the survey, previously badged as the PMI, Purchasing Managers Index, report, signalled further signs of easing of the downturn in Scotland's manufacturing sector, in which output was broadly stable in June. Scotland had been hailed as a standout performer in May in the previous monthly survey, Scotland's private sector economy was in May second only to that of Northern Ireland in the table of growth rates for the UK nations and regions. Scotland and Northern Ireland bucked the trend in May by achieving an acceleration in expansion. The growth tracker published today shows the headline business activity index for Scotland's private sector economy fell from 55.2 in May to 51.9 last month on a seasonally adjusted basis, reflecting the recent cool-down in service sector activity. While the latest reading is still above the level of 50 deemed to separate expansion from contraction, the fall in the index signals a sharp slowdown in growth. The business activity index for the overall UK private sector economy in June was 52.3. 
Employment in Scotland's private sector economy continued to rise in June, but at the second weakest rate since the current run of expansion began in February 2023, the survey showed. Overall cost burdens for Scottish companies rose at the weakest rate in 40 months in June. Apart from South East England, all other UK nations and regions experienced a faster increase in input prices than Scotland in June. The slowdown in growth of private sector output in Scotland in June was accompanied by a fresh fall in new business, which was the first such decline recorded in five months. Scottish companies remained optimistic overall about the prospects for increased business activity on a 12-month horizon. The level of confidence on this front eased slightly last month, but it was broadly in line with a long-run average trend. Royal Bank said businesses were hopeful that demand conditions would improve in the coming months and planned to raise their advertising and investment. Judith Cruikshank, who chairs Royal Bank's Scotland Board, said the Scotland Growth Track has signalled modest gains in private sector activity during the latest survey period. While the upturn lost momentum, as the service sector observed a notable cool-down in June, the ongoing downturn in the manufacturing sector showed further signs of easing as output was broadly stable and the downturn in new orders moderated. Additionally, private sector companies continued to raise their staffing levels, albeit the latest uptick was fractional overall. She added, price pressures continued to abate as the year progressed. Cost burdens rose at the weakest pace since February 2021, and the rate of charge inflation equaled the weakest seen over the same period. Some firms were keen to price competitively in order to generate new sales. Sebastian Burnside, chief economist at Royal Bank, said, Our regional growth tracker shows that most parts of the UK continue to see business activity expand in June, with one or two pockets of real strength. London and Northern Ireland topped the latest rankings, and it's these two that have recorded the strongest average growth so far this year. At the other end of the scale, the only notable decrease in activity at the end of the second quarter was seen in Yorkshire and Humber, which the growth tracker shows has generally underperformed for the best part of a year. Demand conditions varied across the UK in June. The number of nations and regions reporting growth in new business fell, although this masked some stronger performances, especially in Northern Ireland and London, but also in the northwest and southwest of England. He added, business expectations took a bit of a hit almost universally in June, reflecting uncertainty ahead of the general election. Encouragingly, however, most areas saw employment rise as businesses continued to forecast growth in activity over the coming year. An acceleration in output charge inflation across most parts of the UK in June shows continued stickiness in prices, which might give policymakers some pause for thought on interest rates cuts. That article was written by Ian McConnell. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 11th of July, from the news section. Views sought on Holyrood's landmark child poverty legislation. This article is written by Jodie Harrison. A Holyrood committee is seeking views on the landmark legislation which put child poverty targets into law in Scotland. The Social Justice Committee is considering the impact of the Child Poverty Scotland Act 2017. The legislation also created the Poverty and Inequality Commission, which advises the Scottish Government on how to close the gap between the richest and poorest. The legally set target is to reduce relative child poverty to 10% by 2030. Social Justice Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville has said Scotland still has a path to meet this goal, but it will be challenging. Statistics released in March showed the number of children living in relative poverty 
was up by approximately 30,000 from the previous year after housing costs. MSPs on the committee have urged the government to supercharge its efforts around parental employment. Colette Stevenson, MSP, convener of the committee, said, The Child Poverty Act is a landmark piece of legislation, enshrining in law targets to virtually eradicate child poverty by April 2030. As we are now more than halfway towards the date when the 2030 targets are due to be met, our committee would like to hear views on how the Act is working in practice. We're really keen to understand whether putting the targets into law has been effective and what might have been different had the Scottish Government not taken this approach. That article was written by Jodie Harrison. From the Herald Scotland, Thursday the 11th of July, from the sports section, Euro 2024, England reached second successive Euros final. Report by PA News Agency. England are celebrating reaching a second successive European Championship final after Ollie Watkins scored a dramatic last gasp winner against the Netherlands on Wednesday. Here, PA News Agency looks at the latest from the tournament. Sub pays off. England manager Gareth Southgate has been criticised throughout the tournament for his use, or lack of, substitutions, but he certainly got it right on an eventful night in Dortmund. There were nine minutes of a tense semi-final remaining when Southgate made the bold decision to replace captain Harry Kane with Watkins. The change paid off in remarkable fashion as Watkins combined with another substitute in Cole Palmer to snatch a 2-1 victory in the last minute and book a final date with Spain. The game had been locked at 1-1 since the 18th minute when Kane cancelled out a Xavi Simon screamer with a controversial penalty. Watkins said afterwards he had visualised his winner before coming on. The England hero told ITV, I swear on my life, on my kids' lives, I said to Cole Palmer, we're coming on and you're going to set me up. And that's why I was so happy with Coley. I knew as soon as he got the ball he was going to play me in. The normally calm Southgate struggled to contain himself immediately after the final whistle, celebrating his side's triumph with vigour. It has been a difficult few weeks for the England boss, who had, be- who had beer cups thrown at him early in the tournament as his side struggled to impress. Whatever decision he takes over his future after the tournament, he can surely be proud of a record that now features two Euro finals and a World Cup last four spot. He felt the latest achievement was the best of the lot. I think it has to be the best. It's another landmark, he said. It's an amazing feeling. I'm so pleased how we played. We used the ball well all night and caused them a lot of problems. England ride luck again. Amid the jubilation, there was also some acknowledgement that England, after their late equaliser against Slovakia and penalty shootout win against Switzerland, had enjoyed more good fortune. Their penalty, awarded for a foul on Kane by Denzel Dumfries, after a VAR review, was widely considered to fall into the soft category. I think it was an absolutely disgraceful decision, said pundit Gary Neville. It's nowhere near a penalty and I don't think there were many England players claiming for it either. Spain's teenage sensation Lamine Yamal is hoping to make his 17th birthday weekend one to remember by leading his side to glory on Sunday. The Barcelona starlet became the youngest goal scorer in Euros history at 16 years and 362 days, with a stunning equaliser in Spain's 2-1 defeat of France in Tuesday's semi-final. I came here to win all the matches so that I could celebrate my birthday on Saturday here in Germany with all of my teammates, Jamal told UEFA. I'm thrilled that we are in the final, but we still haven't done the most important thing, which is win this. Spain wait on Morata. There have been no updates on the fitness of Alvaro Morata since the Spain captain was injured in a freak incident while celebrating Tuesday's victory. Morata, who had been substituted in the 76th minute, had rejoined his victorious teammates after the final whistle when he was struck by a security guard who slipped in attempting to intercept a pitch invader. He appeared in pain after the collision and limped away. 
manager Luis de la Fuente played down the seriousness of the matter, saying, we don't think it's anything, but the pitch player was due to be assessed on Wednesday. What's next? Sunday, final. Spain v England, 8pm, BBC and ITV. And that report was by the PA News Agency, and it was read to you today by me, Ian McKenna. The Herald on the 12th of July and the Arts and End section. Fringe is great for alchemical wonder. The novelty never wears thin by Herald Magazine. When is your fringe? What is your fringe show about? Showstopper, the improvised musical event is different every night. It's everything you could possibly want from a musical. Comedy, catchy tunes, great lyrics, sweeping store lines, hilarious comedy and heartbreaking moments too. But it's all completely made up on the spot. Nothing is prepared in advance. There are no preset stories or songs or to fall back on. We create the whole show live in front of your eyes and ears. Beyond this, I can't tell you what it's about because the audience hasn't decided yet. We've had shows set on the International Space Station, in Horton supermarkets, at a dating night for Vegas magicians, on a pirate ship, you name it, we have probably done it. After 1,350 musicals, some settings inevitably repeat themselves. We've done a fair share of Bake Off and Love Island musicals. It's our job to create a brand new musical from scratch, even if we were about to set sail on our sixth cruise ship. Well, there are so many different stories you can tell on cruise ships. Booze Cruise is going to be a very different story to The Love Boat. To be honest, after 1,350 shows, we can't remember what we've done in the past anyway, so there's no chance of repetition. I can't wait to see what the 2024 audiences will suggest for us. How many times, many years, have we appeared at the Fringe? This is our 15th year at the Fringe. We started in a 90-seat port cabin in 2008 and have sold out ever since. It's been a great adventure that's taken us all over the world, but we feel like the Fringe is the heart of our touring year. It feels like coming home. What's your most memorable moment from the Fringe? In one of our shows, I found myself playing former British Prime Minister David Cameron, riding a llama through the streets of war-torn London and singing in the style of David Bowie. The full absurdity of the moment hit me and I burst out laughing. To this day, I cannot think about it without laughing. Showstopper has created so many happy moments like this over the years. I also have fond memories of being in Edinburgh with Ken Campbell, the great theatre maverick, when he performed a Shakespeare improv show called In Pursuit of Cardinio. On lunchtime, Ken was to be interviewed by former MP Neil Hamilton and his wife, Christine, on their daytime chat show experiment. Me and Ken were sitting together at the back of the audience, watching the disaster of the show unfolding, waiting for him to go on when he turned to me and whispered, I think I'm going to see if I can alienate the entire audience. What followed was ten minutes of the most delightful absurdity I'd ever seen. The fringe is great for that kind of alchemical wonder. What's the worst thing about the fringe? The litter, the visible detri- detritus of our mass indulgence. If you we were not a performer, what would you be doing? I enjoy writing. I've written a book on improvisation, improv beyond rules. I write short stories and music too. I've written several plays and musicals. And I've just finished writing my first novel. In another life, I'm probably a food cricket critic, not because I would ever criticise someone's food, but because I dream of travelling all over the world, eating everywhere. How do you prepare for performance? You can't really prepare for the unpreparable. There are no lines to run over or moments to rehearse in the showstopper. Instead, I try and make sure I'm relaxed and present. If I can't listen to people properly, then I can't do the show effectively. I'll spend some time with a group backstage as we all tune into each other. Then I'll find a corner for myself and do some quiet rapping on my own. That's a private thing. Nobody needs to hear that. But I find it helps to get my bardic tongue flapping. Favourite thing about being in Edinburgh? It's the biggest arts festival in the world. I can watch the wildest variety of shows 24 hours a day. That novelty never wears thin, and I get to play the show I love to 700 people every day. No two shows are the same, and it's constantly challenging. I love it. What's the most Scottish thing you've ever done? Drinking whiskey in the waters of Loch Awe. Favourite Scottish food or drink? I've never been, had a bad haggis, and I will never forget my trip to the kitchen where I enjoyed a bone marrow and snail dish. I'll be looking for less meaty alternatives this year, though. 
sum up your show in three words. Oh my God. Show, showstopper, the improvised musical is at the Pleasance Courtyard, grand 5.30 p.m. For tickets, go to www.edfringe.com. And that was by the Herald Magazine. The Herald on the 16th of July on the Arts and Ends section. Technology showing impact of art on brains to be used at Scott's Gallery by Mark McDougall. New technology that will show the impact of art has on brain is set to arrive in Scotland later this month, with organisers hoping it will show people just how important it is for mental well-being to attend museums and galleries throughout the country. The groundbreaking technology shows brainwaves in real time and in 3D and is being brought to Scotland by the National Charity for Art, Art Fund, as final stop on its UK-wide tour. It will be in Edinburgh for two days on Thursday, July 25 and Friday, July 26 at the National Gallery Scotland National on the Mound. Anyone in Edinburgh will be able to test the technology out for themselves and will be able to, available to try over the course of the two days next week. It will only be a few hours each day, though, with the tech available to try between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. on Thursday and 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. on Friday. Visitors to the gallery who want to take part will be asked to view art or artefacts while wearing a headset, which is then connected to an electro en electroencephalogram EEG monitor that will then visualize the outputs of their brainwaves as they react to the art on screen in 3D and in real time. The number of people who visit museums in Scotland is relatively low, with around 18% of Scottish adults saying art has no impact on them at all, while 37% of people in Scotland visit re museums less than once a year. That's despite research commissioned to accompany the project, showing that 97, 96% of all adults in Scotland agreeing that visiting museums and galleries is beneficial. That figure rises to 99% in Edinburgh, but still people aren't attending as much as museums and galleries would like. Art Fund Director Jenny Waldman is hoping the technology being used in Edinburgh can encourage more people to visit the museums and galleries that are all around Scotland if they can see how much art does improve well-being and emotions. She said this technology shows how art can improve our well-being and emotions. Audiences love seeing the visualization of their brainwaves when they look at different paintings and objects in museums. So we are thrilled to take this technology on tour. We hope that by bringing the experience to Edinburgh, we can inspire more people to visit the amazing museums and galleries we have on our doorsteps, such as the National Galleries of Scotland. By illustrating the impact of art on people's brains and emotions, the Art Fund is hoping to encourage visitors to attend museums and galleries with a National Art Pass. That gives you free entry to hundreds of museums, galleries and historic houses across the UK, as well as making major ex exhibitions half price, while it can also save you money on museums, shops and cafes. The project will highlight how your brain is stimulated when you experience art in museums and galleries. In turn, it is then hoped you will, it will allow you to understand the fundamental value of art and the impact it has on your day-to-day -day life, as well as when you go to visit the galleries. It is the final stop on its UK tour, with the Brainwaves experience already having been in Bath, Cardiff, Guildford, Wakefield and Warwickshire over the recent months throughout the spring and summer. Anne Lydon is the Director General of the National Galleries of Scotland and is excited to welcome the project to the country. She's excited to see how people of Edinburgh react to the project and it's hopeful it continue, continue the trend of people feeling that a visit to the galleries can have a positive impact on their health and well-being. She said it's a real pleasure, pleasure to be able to host this world-first technology here at the new Scotch Galleries at the National, and it's fascinating to see the impact that art can have on all of us. The National Galleries of Scotland carried out re research recently, which showed that around 86% of our visitors felt that visiting the galleries had a positive impact on their well-being. And we can't wait to see this reflected in brainwaves. We're looking forward to welcoming local residents to the gallery to test out this exciting technology and to see the incredible art that belongs to the people of Scotland. And that was by Mark McDougall. From the Herald Scotland, 
Sunday the 14th of July, from the news section, Scotland's political leaders condemn Trump assassination attempt. Report by Jodie Harrison. Political leaders in Scotland have condemned the assassination attempt on Donald Trump, with First Minister John Swinney branding the shooting unacceptable. Mr Swinney spoke out after Mr Trump said a bullet pierced part of his ear in the incident, which happened at a campaign rally in the US. The suspected gunman was killed while the security service confirmed one person in the crowd had died, with two others critically injured. The Republican is attempting to return to the White House in November's presidential elections, with Saturday's rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, part of his re-election campaign. UK Prime Minister Sir Keir Starmer said he was appalled by the shooting, while, in Scotland, the First Minister made clear such violence had no place in a democratic society. Responding to the attack on X, formerly known as Twitter, the SNP leader said, There is no place for violence in society, including in our politics. The attack on President Trump has no place in a democratic society. My thoughts are with all those affected by this unacceptable incident. Other political leaders in Scotland also condemned the shooting, with Labour's Anna Sauer speaking out about the horrific scenes at the Trump rally last night. The Scottish Labour leader added, In a democracy, there must be the ability to disagree without turning to hatred or violence. My thoughts are with President Trump, his family and all those impacted. I know my American friends friends will be hurting today, sending love. Outgoing Scottish Conservative leader Douglas Ross joined him in condemning the shocking scenes from the US with this assassination attempt on the former president. Mr Ross added, Our thoughts are with the innocent people killed and injured in Pennsylvania. In democracies, appalling violence like this will never prevail. Meanwhile, Scottish Liberal Democrat leader Alex Cole Hamilton made clear there is no place for political violence in any democracy. He added, The Trump assassination attempt is an appalling act. And that article was written by Jodie Harrison and read by me, Ian McKenna. From the Herald Scotland, Sunday the 14th of July, from the culture section, sweet success, Rick Stein said our chocolate was the best he'd tasted, we've never been so busy, by Sarah Campbell, it's one of Glasgow's greatest food and drink success stories in recent years, a firm beloved by TV's Rick Stein and it produced its products, given pride of place on dessert menus across Scotland. But Beerbones Chocolate might never have come to be were it not for a particularly rough day at work for Lara Dixon, which prompted a move back home in search of a sweeter way of life. I was working as a food photographer in London and always found it so inspiring to visit small businesses where people had such hands-on jobs, she said. Later I started to transition into fashion photography, which was a bit of a disaster. There was a really difficult client and I remember sitting on the journey home one day thinking to myself, I really don't want to do this. I pulled a bar of chocolate out of my bag and started eating it, then started to picture what it would be like to make chocolate all day, every day. I googled it and learned that a lot of it comes down to science and numbers, which is perfect for my husband Cameron, who has a background in engineering. We quit our jobs and moved back to Glasgow. New Calling Inspired and fully committed to this new calling, The first bare bones bars were created in 2018 using an old coffee roaster in a garage that belonged to Dixon's parents. A new home in Osborne Street in the Salt Market area followed as the pair realised their dream was past becoming a reality thanks to building interest in their small batch production process that takes raw cocoa beans all the way to a finished bar. Treating their chocolate with the same reverence as a sommelier with a fine wine, the duo always aimed for complex flavours which develop and enrich over a standard maturation period of two to three weeks. Also paramount to their core ethos is ensuring workers at every stage of the supply chain are fairly paid at farms that understand the importance of sustainability when it comes to cocoa beans. This attention to detail and unwavering dedication to the craft is what earned them a spot in the Glasgow episode of Rick Stein's Food Stories in February as a glowing review from the celebrity chef Capital... 
catapulted bare bones into a whole new light. People love Rick Stein and really trust his opinion because he's so knowledgeable. Even seeing him walk down Osborne Street felt so surreal for us because we've been watching him on TV for our whole lives. First reaction. They didn't let him taste any of the chocolate before the camera was rolling because they wanted to get his genuine first reaction. Then he said it was the best chocolate he's ever tasted, which was unbelievable and we've been ever so busy ever since. The team experienced such an increase in demand for their bars, including the 70% Philippines dark chocolate selected by Stein for use in an indulgent profiterole recipe, that they still warn of potential delays in dispatching orders due to this year's TV appearance. But even after Bear Bones ended a new era, with the opening of a retail shop on King Street, Glasgow in May, Dixon has vowed that expansion will never come at the cost of the high standards they always ha- have always maintained. We were struggling for space and started to look elsewhere, but the thought of leaving that area was really sad, she continued. That railway art set- setting feels like a huge part of our brand now. Then we found a new space that was right around the corner and had these big gorgeous windows. We designed and built the whole shop from scratch and now can run backwards and forwards for stock or all have lunch together. We're so lucky we have such a great community around us that shares our dedication to doing things right. The wider foodie community in Glasgow has also warmly welcomed bare bones into its pastry selections from gooey brownie bites at Falakin to a smooth creme at the Gannet. I think that's one of the things we're most proud of with bare bones, Dixon said. We always hoped that we could work with the coffee shops we love and admire or the restaurant that you would be proud to send someone to if they were visiting Glasgow. Places like Capal, Oaks and Finch and the Gannet care so much about what they they do and the ingredients they serve. For them to know our story and relay that to their customers is so cool and we love being part of that community. Just over halfway through 2024, the team has already ticked off some extraordinarily bucket list experiences. Potential. As to what comes next, there's talk of potential for opening new outlets across the country while continuing to forge connections with like-minded producers across Scotland. With the prospect of such a bright future ahead, Dixon said, I'm so glad it's all worked out because we are so passionate about chocolate. I could never have imagined that this is what we would be dedicating our lives to, but this is the best thing we've ever done. Bear Bones is located at 111 King Street in Glasgow and that article was written by Sarah Campbell. The Herald, Monday the 15th of July from the news section. Ian Murray pledges reset of relations with SNP government. Labour plans to bring change to all four corners of Scotland as the UK party embarks on its first spell in government for 14 years. Newly installed Secretary of State Ian Murray has said that Prime Minister Sir Keir Starmer intends to reset Westminster's relationships with the Scottish Government in the coming months, as people are fed up with the two administrations fighting each other. Mr Murray and Sir Keir embarked on a whirlwind charm offensive north of the border last week, meeting newly installed Labour MPs, business leaders and council bosses, as well as First Minister John Swinney. Mr Murray said that the time had come to do things differently after years of Tory rule and cross-border spate between Edinburgh and London. Writing in the Herald, he said, We know that for too long now Scots have been fed up of our two governments spending more time fighting each other rather than fighting for them. I want to reset our relationship with the Scottish Government. I want to turn disagreement into cooperation. I want the Scottish Government to have a seat at the table to work with us to deliver generational change. Around the table, there are clearly political differences, but there are also areas where we can work together to improve the lives of the people of Scotland. It is those issues want, need to focus on. There is a genuine will to do things differently. Mr Murray, who was Labour's sole MP before July 5th, said his first official engagement at the Scottish Office HQ in his new job as Secretary of State was to host a business roundtable with organisations including the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, the Institute of Directors, 
Scottish Financial Enterprise, Prosper, CBI Scotland and the Federation of Small Businesses. He said that Labour will seek to unlock Scotland's limitless economic potential, not least with the sighting of proposed energy firm GB Energy north of the border. He said, we want change for all four corners of the UK and for all four corners of Scotland. Resetting the relationships to deliver for the Scottish people isn't just about Holyrood and Westminster. It's about all of our communities across Scotland. This week, I also spoke to the leaders of Edinburgh, Glasgow and Highland Councils and plan to speak to other council leaders in the coming weeks. That's the change Scotland needs and the change I am ready to work tirelessly to help deliver. That was an exclusive article by Jodie Harrison. The Herald, Monday the 15th of July from the news section. Major update after Glasgow and Aberdeen Airport strike threat. The threat of strike action at two Scottish airports has been lifted after hundreds of workers agreed to an improved pay offer. Trade Union Unite said around 300 Central Search members based at Glasgow and Aberdeen airports employed by ICTS have overwhelmingly accepted an improved pay offer ending the dispute. Unite had said on July the 2nd that unless there was a significant movement by ICTS in the coming days, then strike action could start in mid-July at the peak of the summer holiday rush. Following workers' acceptance of the improved pay deal in a ballot, which closed on Friday, Pat Mickelvogue, Unite's lead industrial officer for aviation in Scotland, said, Unite has successfully negotiated a significant boost to the pay packets of ICTS workers at Aberdeen and Glasgow airports. We are pleased that the company got back round the table to make an improved offer, which was acceptable to our members. The possibility of strike action at the airports is now over. Detailing the terms of the improved offer, Unite said, the pay deal delivers a basic pay rise of 5% a one-off payment of £500 and an enhancement to the shift allowance of 75 pence per hour, which is an uplift worth around 5.9% is also included in the deal. There will be access to double-time shift rates for Christmas and New Year's Day. The overall pay package boost is estimated to be worth up to 12.8% for some workers at ICTS. The trade union added that, in addition, ICTS will be advertising a minimum of 15 full-time posts, which will be initially offered to existing part-time staff following negotiations with Unite. The trade union had said on July 2nd that the ICTS central search workers at Aberdeen and Glasgow airports had emphatically rejected a basic pay increase of 4%, backdated to January 2024, and a £500 one-off payment. Unite said then the strike action had been backed by 98.5% at Glasgow Airport involving around 200 ICTS workers. A ballot involving around 100 workers at Aberdeen Airport returned a similar result with 89.7% backing strike action, it noted. Following the acceptance by the ICTS workers at Glasgow and Aberdeen airports of the improved pay offer, Unite General Secretary Sharon Graham said, Unite's members employed by ICTS at Aberdeen and Glasgow airports have overwhelmingly backed an improved pay deal. Unite has delivered another significant win for airport workers in Scotland. Unite noted that ICTS workers deal with passengers directly in the security search areas and process them for flights. It added that these employees also cover mobile patrols, control access posts, screen all deliveries and deal with emergency services. That was an article by Ian McConnell. The Herald, Monday the 15th of July from the news section. SNP to push for a child benefit cap to be scrapped. The SNP will urge the government to abolish the two-child benefit cap if it does not move to do so itself, Stephen Flynn has said. Mr Flynn has written to Anna Sarwar, the Scottish Labour leader, 
urging him to instruct his party's MPs in Scotland to support the SNP move. The cap, introduced by Conservatives in 2017, prevents parents claiming universal credit or child tax credits for a third child, except in very limited circumstances. The SNP Westminster leader will table an amendment to the King's speech, which will be made on Wednesday, setting out the government's legislative agenda. MPs then have the opportunity to debate the contents of the speech in the following days, at which point they can lay amendments to it. Power over which amendments are selected is in the gift of the House of Commons Speaker Sir Lindsay Hoyle. In his party's first major intervention since the general election, Mr Flynn said the two-child cap is pushing thousands of Scottish children into poverty and ending it is the bare minimum required of the new government. His letter to the Scottish Labour leader claimed the Tory two-child cap became the Labour Party two-child cap once Sir Keir Starmer stepped through the door of Downing Street. In the letter, Mr Flynn said it would be simple for the government to scrap the cap immediately, but added this was a political choice and it requires politicians across parties to demand better. Appealing to Mr Sarwar, the SNP Westminster leader wrote that he was willing to work together for the betterment of the people of Scotland and claimed the cap was a good place for this work to begin. The general election saw the SNP's numbers at Westminster reduced to nine MPs, as Labour swept up many of its central belt seats in its landslide victory. Speaking ahead of the King's speech, Mr Flynn said, The two-child cap is pushing thousands of Scottish children into poverty and scrapping it is the bare minimum the Labour Party government must do if it is serious about tackling poverty. I urge Keir Starmer to include it in his programme for government this week, but if he fails, the SNP will lay an amendment to abolish it immediately. It is shameful and it must go now. He urged Sir Keir's government to also take further bold action to eradicate child poverty, including matching Holyrood's Scottish child payment across the UK by raising the child element of universal credit by £26.70 per child per week. Figures published last week by the Department for Work and Pensions showed there were 1.6 million children living in households affected by the cap as of April this year, up from 1.5 million in, to April 2023. Of these, 52% of children were in households with three children, 29% in households with four children and 19% in households with five or more children. Last month, before becoming Prime Minister, Sir Keir said he would scrap the two-child limit in an ideal world, but added that we haven't got the resources to do it at the moment. The Resolution Foundation has said that abolishing the two-child limit would cost the government somewhere between £2.5 billion and £3.6 billion in 2024-25, but that such costs are low compared to the harm that the policy causes. That was an article by David Lynch. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 15th of July, from the Arts and Entertainment section, Unprofessional Sees a Comedian's Dream Achieved at Edinburgh Fringe by Herald Magazine, the best ever weekly guide to everything happening in Scotland. Twitter handle, at sign, Ye Alex is Gay. 1. Tell us about your fringe show. Hey, do you have a minute? Bad from your boyfriend but worse from your boss? Unprofessional is my comedy debut about working, or uh, not working, in tech, and one very specific 4pm meeting on the second floor of a company we'll call Redacted. The, the show explores making you work your entire personality, going nowhere on a hedonic treadmill, and worrying so much about your LinkedIn profile that it lands you at the hair doctor. 2. How does it feel to be playing the Fringe for the first time? It feels so brilliant to be coming to the Fringe this year. A cheeky little fact is it's my second time bringing a show. I brought a compilation show last year called Alexis Gay and Friends. I wanted to learn as much as possible about what it looks and feels like to run a show. I'm excited to have the chance to apply what I learned. 
I'm exactly as typey as this answer makes me sound, but I promise I am also fun. Ask around. 3. Why did you decide to perform at the Fringe? There's nowhere quite like the Fringe. I first attended in 2022 and left feeling completely energised and creatively fulfilled. After seeing so many incredible shows, it became a dream of mine to write and perform my own at the Fringe one day. Also, I live in the US and we don't have anything like it over there. It's such a rare and special opportunity to perform for almost 25 days in a row. Audiences at the Fringe are the best. It seems like they're just as excited to participate in live theatre as I am to make it. For that reason, it's such a privilege to be able to make my show better and better by running it over and over again for such an engaged group. Also, last year, I made so many wonderful friends. It was such a treat to connect with comedians from different parts of the world. 4. If you were not a performer, what would you be doing? I left a seven-year career in the tech industry to be a full-time comedian, so if I wasn't doing this, I think I'd still be there. I'd probably still be trying out jokes every day, but instead of on stage in Edinburgh, it would be in big team meetings on Zoom. 5. How do you prepare for a performance? I need one or maybe two coffees. In an ideal world, I would have started the day with a black coffee and indulged in a little treat like a cappuccino in the afternoon. There aren't a lot of places in the UK that serve filter slash drip slash pour over coffee. I think I found all the ones in Edinburgh. 6. Best slash worst advice you've been given ahead of your debut show. I think the best advice I've been given is to recognise it's a marathon and not a sprint. To sleep, drink water, take care of yourself. I think that's the best way to make sure you're able to give each audience the 110% they deserve. I don't think I've been given any truly bad advice, but I guess we'll find out. 7. Favourite thing about being in Edinburgh? I am so in love with the Edinburgh larder. All of their food is so fresh and delicious and the inside is so cosy. It's the perfect place to enjoy a long, relaxed meal. As such, I can only go when I have plenty of time, which... At the Fringe is a luxury that's hard to come by. That makes every time I'm able to go quite special. 8. What's the most Scottish thing you've done? I actually didn't know this was Scottish, but I've been saying hiya for years before I got to the Fringe. Now, it seems like I fit right in. Or it seems like I'm one of those Americans that come to the UK and immediately adopts the accent. Hoping the former. 9. Favourite Scottish food slash drink? There's nothing better than a proper Scottish fry-up. It's just the right amount of food and full of great energy to power me up the cobblestone hills. 10. Sum up your show in three words. All funny business. Alexis Gay's debut stand-up show Unprofessional is at the Underbelly, George Square, We Coo, at 4.20pm. For tickets, go to www.edfringe.com. Dot com. That's www.edfringe.com And that report was taken from the Herald magazine. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 15th of July, from the business section. Exclusive, Homes for Scotland. It is obvious we need to start doing things differently. This article is an exclusive by Martin Williams. The head of the representative body for home builders has criticised a lack of action on dealing with the housing emergency. Homes for Scotland Chief Executive Jane Wood also highlights the challenging environment home builders in Scotland must operate within and the levers the Scottish Government can pull now to make an immediate difference. The Herald is to be applauded for the tremendous public service it has undertaken over the last week by raising awareness of the scale and wide-reaching social impact of Scotland's housing emergency. The decisive general election outcome offers new opportunities and refreshed political choices. As such, it has been very encouraging to see the new UK government placing a major emphasis on housing delivery in the planning system within 72 hours of it coming into power. But, with these devolved matters north of the border, what, if anything, does this mean for the hundreds of thousands of Scottish households that have been identified by independent research 
as being in some form of housing need. With the Scottish Government acknowledging a national housing emergency in May, and housing starts and completions in ongoing decline, surely it must be obvious that owing to, the, the, to all that we need to start doing things differently. The figures we are releasing today showing that around 5,000 new high quality energy efficient homes have been stalled because of cuts to the affordable housing supply programme underscore both the importance and urgency of a new approach. These alarming figures come on the back of recent research showing an alarming reduction in the SME home building sector. This revealed that the proportion of new homes being sold by those building between 3 and 49 homes per annum has fallen from around 40% in 2017 to less than 20% in 2023 with the number of companies being dissolved rising significantly. Insights from builders point to the planning and wider consenting process as having the biggest detrimental impact. So funding and planning then, and absolutely no surprises to anyone at the coalface of housing delivery. Will the Scottish Government recalibrate to tackle these challenges that are firmly in its grasp? Will it bravely acknowledge that the root causes lie in an underinvestment of our planning regime and a regulatory environment? that fails to recognise the unintended consequences of policies created with poor understanding of the costs and impacts on both consumers and those organisations that build the much-needed homes of all tenures that we require. Scotland's population deserves better than the same old tired responses blaming Brexit, cost price inflation and Westminster. These are, of course, significant issues, but nowhere near as pressing as the risk and uncertainty of trying to navigate a planning system which takes over 62 weeks to process a major housing application, or trying to determine long-term investment in construction programming against such a constrained financial backdrop. And these are factors adversely affecting both private for sale and affordable housing, given the strong interdependencies across sectors. With another 18 months before the Scottish 2026 elections, there is time for impactful change, but this requires strong political leadership direction at pace and a joined up approach across government at all levels. Last month, we, along with colleagues at the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, Chartered Institute of Housing, Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers, Joseph Rowntree Foundation and Shelter Scotland, wrote to the First and Deputy First Ministers calling for an urgent meeting and setting out priority areas to be addressed. Declaring a housing emergency is meaningless if it only results in more of the same. We know what has to be done and it is frustratingly simple. Build more homes and create the policy environment that facilitates it. Nearly four weeks later, our letter still awaits a response. Jane Wood is the Chief Executive of Homes for Scotland, the representative body for home builders. Its wide-ranging membership together delivers the majority of the country's new homes of all tenures, spanning smaller developers, registered social landlords, larger home building companies, PLCs and associated business businesses in the supply chain. As told to Martin Williams. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 15th of July, from the business section, protesters to return if Aberdeen ETZ plan goes a, gets go-ahead. By Gabriel Mackay, Climate activists have ended a five-day occupation of a park in Aberdeen, but warned they will return if a controversial energy plan goes ahead. Plans have been drawn up to create an Energy Transition Zone, ETZ, at St Fittix Park in the Corry area of the city. It would see development of a square mile of greenbelt land in the area to support renewable energy production at the South Harbour. The private sector project is the brainchild of Aberdonian businessman Sir Ian Wood and has received over £50 million in funding from the Scottish and UK governments. Opponents of the ETZ have criticised plans to remove green space in one of Aberdeen's most deprived communities as well as expressing doubts over its green credentials. The plans rely heavily on carbon capture technology, which is unproven at scale, as well as hydrogen. According to the International Energy Agency, 99% of globally produced hydrogen is produced with fossil fuels. Mr Wood made his fortune in North Sea oil, while the board of the ETZ also includes representatives from Shell, 
the North Sea Transition Authority and Scottish Enterprise. Last week, the group of Friends of St Fittix Park set up camp on the site as part of a five-day protest against the plans. That ended on Monday, but the activists said they will return if the plans go ahead. A judicial review on the ETZ proposal is expected to, at the end of this month at the Court of Session in Edinburgh. Margot Bushman, a local Tory resident and a member of the Aberdeen Climate Coalition, said, As a Tory local, it means so much to see people from across Scotland and Europe come here united to show solidarity with the fight to save St Fittix Park. The fossil fuel industry has been trying to set a precedent for how it can treat the people of Tory, polluting our air and paving off over our parks. This time with the cheap veneer of greenwashing. Though climate camp leaves St Fittix on Monday, our energy remains high as the fight continues. This part belongs to the community, not to the energy transition zone. Rosie, a climate activist from the Highlands, said, The end of camp does not mean the end of our active solidarity with Tory. The camp this year has been a great success, but if the so-called energy transition zone goes ahead, we will be back. We will stand with the people of Tory against the destruction of their park. An ETZ spokesperson said, Through our community and coast programme, ETZ Limited are firmly committed to enhancing wider green spaces in proximity of the energy transition zone, in co-design and collaboration with the local community. This will include significant improvement to St Fittix Park, Tulos Woods and the Coastal Park Corridor as part of the project's wider regeneration ambitions. It is important to highlight that we are proposed utilising, subject to planning, a significantly reduced area of development to St Fittix Park, with just over half of the Aberdeen City Council proposed sites being developed, equating to less than a third of the park overall. The ability to connect land with port assets and transport large components to and from Quayside is a fundamental requirement, so we achieved the investment required to ensure Aberdeen is positioned to capitalise on the vast opportunities provided by new and green energies, particularly offshore wind. Almost all other ports of scale across Scotland are making similar investments and we simply don't want Aberdeen to miss out on the opportunity to position itself as a globally recognised hub for offshore renewables and the significant job benefits this will bring. Aberdeen City Council has been contacted for comment. An article was written by Gabriel Mackay and read by me, Ian McKenna. This is from the Herald Scotland of Tuesday the 16th of July 2024 from the Voices section. SNP and ScotRail are giving public ownership a bad name. This article is by Gregor Gall. History repeats itself, first time as tragedy, second time as farce. With a slight bastardization, this is a frequently used, if not also famous, quote from Karl Marx in his 1852 essay entitled The 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. Sticking with the French connection and with the aid of Crystal Ball, the travails of Scotrail could easily have been the kind of thing Marx had in mind some 172 years later. Two years ago, on April the 1st, Scotrail was returned to public ownership after 25 years of privatisation. The following month, the new Scotrail experienced something of a baptism of fire in the form of widespread industrial action when members of the Aslev Drivers Union refused to work overtime in a dispute over their pay rise. This led to widespread cancellation of services because of the shortage of drivers. This was a tragedy of a new but much needed experiment in public ownership being laid low by the inability of the management to train enough new drivers. But the new Scotrail had a get-out clause. This was that it had only just been in operation for a short while, and so was operating with the legacy of the previous private company. Indeed, and again showing a French connection, it argued it was the subject of force majeure, namely 
an uncontrollable event like war or extreme weather that is not its fault and makes it difficult or impossible for it to carry out its normal operations. This force majeure took the form of the pandemic public health regulations preventing ScotRail from being able to train an estimated 130 drivers. But now we have the farce, maybe even a French farce, if the aforementioned tragedy was a Greek one. Two years on from then, ScotRail still does not have enough drivers and has now, again, begun widely cutting back on the number of services it runs because drivers are again refusing to work voluntary overtime to voice their dissatisfaction over the poor pay rise that they have been offered. As new drivers take part in a training programme which lasts between 18 and 24 months, ScotRail has no get-out clause this time, however. For a weary travelling public hoping returning ScotRail to public ownership would bring light at the end of the tunnel, it must seem that an April fool has been played on it. But the bigger picture is that, along with other well-known calamities, such as Ferguson Marine and Caledonian McBrain, the SNP Scottish Government is giving public ownership a very bad name. And, to boot, it is doing so at precisely a time when privatisation of the likes of Thames Water has been shown to be a cul-de-sac for citizens and consumers, but not capitalists. This is nothing short of catastrophic. The SNP claims to be a left-of-centre social democratic party, and one of the quintessential characteristics of social democracy is public ownership. This is because public ownership is the main way in which the social democratic state can intervene in the processes and outcomes of the market in order to ameliorate the market's effects of inequality. The view of the public in Scotland has increasingly become that the Scottish government cannot build ships on time and to cost, like Ferguson Marine, it has allowed a ferry service to be run aground with an ageing and decrepit fleet, Caledonian McBrain. It has permitted management to lavish luxurious training trips upon itself, Scottish Water. And it has tolerated executives giving themselves huge pay rises while sacking staff, Glasgow City College. To say that the Scottish Government has lost its reputation with citizens for competent government would then be something of an understatement. Certainly, that was one of the reasons cited by commentators as to why the SNP lost so many votes and seats in the recent general election. Moreover, for a political party that has run itself in a managerialist manner, some would say even a Stalin-esque style, this is quite mind-boggling. So... How can all this be explained? Well, the first part to explaining this is because the SNP's version of public ownership is the new neoliberal form of state commercialism. State companies and not core parts of the Scottish state itself. In the case of ScotRail, it is operating on pretty much the same principles as before, when it existed in the private sector and when Abellio had the franchise. Let's also recall that with ScotRail, the move to becoming a state company was a reluctant one. The SNP Scottish Government issued Abellio with umpteen improvement notices, but that made no difference. It then was forced to establish a state-owned operator of last resort, Scottish Rail Holdings, in order to take over and provide ScotRail services. Whereupon, the self-same SNP Scottish Government dismissed the opportunity to implement its own fair work policy based upon five principles, including effective voice, security and respect for workers. So, it could have created worker directors, 
and with them secured a far more stable set of industrial relations for ScotRail. But more fundamentally, the second part to explaining this, the resolution to the riddle, comes from understanding the nature of the SNP. Its claim to be social democratic is somewhat hollow because it still consciously chooses to use private sector logic and capability to deliver public services. And that means giving management far more leeway than it should. But it goes deeper than that, because the SNP wants a smart and successful form of Scottish capitalism to be able to generate the taxes to pay for its social welfare policies, and so will brook no opposition to anything that stops this Scottish capitalism being given the best chance to be profitable. All this goes to show that in and of itself, public ownership is a necessary but not sufficient condition to lead to good and equitable outcomes. Public ownership must be of a genuine social democratic bent where the perspective is not to save private ownership from itself by bailing it out or by trying to run it more profitably than the private sector could. That article was by Gregor Gall, who was visiting Professor of Industrial Relations at the University of Leeds and author of The Mick Lynch, The Making of a Working Class Hero, published by the Manchester University Press in 2024. That concludes this week's edition of the Here in Scotland podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review. Tell your friends about our service. 